All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Ellen. I'm a teen and adult librarian at the Myersville Community Library. Um, and today I'm thrilled to have with me um, Cameron Barnett, who's a poet and a teacher. Um, he's the author of The Drowning Boy's Guide to Water, which was the winner of the Autumn House Press 2017 Rising Writers Contest. Um, so this evening, um, we'll have Cameron do um, a couple of readings for us. Um, and then if you have any questions or comments throughout, um, please feel free to leave those in the chat, we'll have somebody monitoring for those questions um, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion afterwards. So Cameron, thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen, for having me. I'm excited to be here and to get to read. Um, I will be reading a few poems from uh, my book that Ellen mentioned, The Drowning Boy's Guide to Water. Um, I can chat more about that book at the end too if folks have questions. Um, and also reading a couple poems from uh, some newer poems that I'm working on in another project. Um, so any questions you have, ask away. Um, just a little bit about me before I get into my reading. I, uh, I tend to write about what I call the three R's, race, romance, and relationships. It's sort of like how I organize um, a lot of the poems, particular, particularly this project. So some of the poems I'll read kind of give you a glimpse to that. So this first poem I, I usually like to begin readings with is called To the Octopus. I got cold cocked in the mouth once by a kid blacker than me for talking white to him outside the cafeteria, lost four teeth to the tiled hallway, painted a stripe of red down my shirt. I'd speak of the pain, but I'm telling you a story you already know. I've seen you cling to coral so tight you become every color all at once. Camouflage is essential. We know this. But when I watch you, I realize how you can squeeze through most things if your mouth fits just right. I'm still learning. I held half my mouth in a sandwich bag when my father picked me up at school. Couldn't tally each tooth in the blood smeared plastic. Asked me, What did you do? I'm trying to be more like you now. The other day, I passed a brick wall. Imagine my arms fourfold pressed my palms to it until there was no air, but I didn't turn tan. Later, I stood on a packed bus, coiling my arms around the railing, still black. How do you shoot skin out of your body? I have seen you leave limbs behind, each a little brain, distracting predators. You think of anything to stay alive. I have to mind my mouth and limbs in public. They don't grow back. My mother stayed in the operating room for hours. I was so sedated, she stayed by my side and never ate. I woke up to the dentist teasing her about the churn in her stomach. It was louder than my drill. Mothers will starve for us. They know this. Hunger is second nature. Being eaten is what they call love, isn't it? My gums leaked well into the summer. I stopped brushing for weeks. Too many toothbrushes left in peppermint swirl my mouth unchanged, save for the cursing of that kid's name. Maybe if my blood were blue, I'd have three hearts like you. One for forgiving, one for forgetting, one for moving on. Watching you now, I know why you blacken the water and run. Um, I am from Pittsburgh. I'm in Pittsburgh now. Um, and a bunch of the poems in this book uh, are about place and about Pittsburgh. Um, and I have one poem in here <clears throat> that is called Solemn Pittsburgh Abad, um, that to me is sort of like a little, uh, it's like a love poem to the city of Pittsburgh in some ways. Um, an Abad, A-U-B-A-D-E, is a, a term I learned that basically is sort of like a morning poem or a morning song um, for like the beginning of the day. Uh, so even though it's evening, <laughs> I still wanna read this poem to you all. Solemn Pittsburgh Abad. There are houses on fire every night here. It doesn't seem a sin to let them burn. It doesn't scare me to wake up to their ghosts still hanging skyward. A siren in the war streets, its doppelganger spotted in Garfield, clear across this city, tucked tight between smokestacks smacked along every shore barge brown rivers in a slow grind against the Allegheny Plateau. Nothing much changes here. It was built this way and it was built to burn. I like it like that. After all, what is water without steel to cross it? 
a mountain that you cannot pierce, a city without forest all around. Here is where autumn comes to die, on stone steps and gridless potholed streets. I spend my days by a cathedral watching traffic swell and swirl. I spend my time like a poem spends its lines, trying to find where to pause and where to stop. Most endings and pauses I find can hurt. One time I loved somebody. One time I crossed this street when I was in love. Time will damage anything if you let it. So we've built this place to last, placed placards of history along the streets and landmarked any building that dares to crumble. This is Pittsburgh, black and gold bones buried deep, dinosaurs at cobblestone intersections wrapped in scars, 100 ton iron ladles frozen in shopping districts. We only fight each other about what doesn't get to stay. Sometimes on these stone steps, I fight myself about what to keep and what to remember. My heart is a museum where all the exhibits are closed. Love in this city comes as often as the sun, the reset of September pulling clouds over Mount Washington, where I lived and worked, where some nights I'd walk its edge and see houses burning on the horizon and feel the flames in my chest. I didn't have a word for it then. All I knew was the feeling of coming home in the evening to my roommate on his computer, watching videos of chess masters playing each other, the silence of him slumped sideways on the sofa, stacks of Nietzsche and Young casting shadows on half full, half empty coffee cups, eyes heavy with the shade of the room, a reflection of Bobby Fisher in his glasses, hand on the rook and my roommate's hand on the trackpad, history with the slide of a finger. And I'm gonna read one, uh, maybe two more from this book. <clears throat> um, poets write about a lot of their obsessions and proclivities and a couple of mine are constellations, stars, months and board games. Um, so if you were to look across my poems, especially this book, those things come up a lot. Um, so this poem Firefly uh, takes up board games. This summer belongs to the little lamps without gravity, flickering in and out of the night faster than the stars. I watch them dance across the grass like constellations coming alive. For so many summers, this is all I've had, Dad. Tonight, I pull out the old chessboard, black plastic bishops snapped, teeth on rooks' crowns cracked. You set your pieces, handing me the black ones as always. Even as a boy, you made me go last, taught me some games, take patience. I could never defeat you. Back then, I once asked where the light in the bulb came from. You told me great people went to the sky and caught enough stars to make the earth glow. Stars that couldn't be tamed became fireflies. Every summer we played chess. You never let me win. At times between moves, the board held dust like snowfall. I'd sit outside and name the fireflies, never telling you about all the constellations I found. I didn't want you to know I was studying their swift light, how I was learning the patterns, quick flash, long smolder, how long before the flickers matched up then fell apart. I used to wonder if light ever grew tired of moving faster than anything. Now, after a quarter of my life, I still don't know where the stars belong. We revisit these broken pieces, white pawn, black knight, white bishop, black king. You give the same stale opening moves and in an hour I've beaten you. You turn to leave, still not letting me win. I have learned all there is to patience. I want to take everything you think you taught me and teach you what I've learned. <clears throat> right, let's see. You know what, I'm actually gonna jump to some of the newer poems, just cause I'm excited to read them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> not that I don't love this book, but i um, been working on a new manuscript that is um, taking up place, family, heritage. Um, and so this first poem is actually a poem for my sister. She doesn't know that yet, but one day she will. <laughs> it's called Because. 
because I was always better at word games because my sister was always better at Mancala. Her hand, a shifty, surly, scooping sidewinder, dipping into the pockmarked mahogany between us at 12 and 10 apiece. Her hand, a constant passing back and forth around the board. My hand, shaped better for pen and paper. Because picking up pieces means knowing where to place them. Because we are pieces of the people who came before us. Because our ancestry is more Plinko than Pac-Man. Yet this redistribution, she was so good at, like something in the blood. And it made mine boil to watch her snatch away every last glob of glass into the end pit. And I'd marvel at how easy it was for her to get there. Because it takes so much movement to wind up where you're headed. Because Mancala means movement. Because she would drop her last stone in her store and say, eat your heart out. And I tried in vain to prove her wrong and always sewed too short and filled the remaining spaces with words I wasn't proud of. Because every game is still a word game to me. And I could give the definition of countenance or easily spell nauseous correctly on command, but I couldn't seem to count my moves correctly ahead of time. And isn't that what family is for? Wasn't our blood picked up and dropped here, moved all around this continent just to arrive where we are? What's the word for that? I'm asking because at 28 in the evening of my youth, I'm only just learning that words aren't everything. Because even though these childhood games are still fresh in my head, I still wish my sister could pick us up like little pieces of glass and place us right back there. Guilty confession, I'm not 28 anymore, but I wrote that poem when I was. Only I could go back. Um, I think this might be my last piece um, that I'll read. Uh, I wanna leave some time for discussion. Um, <clears throat> like I said, this manuscript is about place and history and exploration. Um, so this next poem is the last poem I wrote before the pandemic shut everything down. I was traveling through South Carolina last year um, doing research on family history and as far back as I can trace in genealogical records, which took me to um, South Carolina. So this is a poem about that trip and it's called South Carolina. From here, perhaps I come. The county's as crinkled as the creeks, but the ground runs low, slow scraped into the horizon where the highway slips beneath the dark edges of the day, like the long pole of a comforter up past the eyes. I'm too fast for this place, but my blood has borne that out already. Everything, as they say, slower here. The land is an open mouth full of water. Even the rain has nowhere to go. It sits and seeps by the road on the way to the plantation I visit one night. Under a Chinese light show, I hold my love's white hand while we pass LED frogs and dragons. I'm not looking at the lights. I regard the live oaks and what they might know. <clears throat> what weight has sunk their roots and gnarled their limbs. Perhaps we, perhaps we recognize each other. I didn't know how wooded this land was. I don't know everything that these woods know, but I know the dark edges of the plantation hold back everything I love. The pulse in my neck is a whisper of wings through the branches. In the air, a barracoon tune hangs like Spanish moss. In this, my making. In this, my heart. There is no joggling board flexible enough <clears throat> to bring together my tears and the turf. From here, perhaps I come through a line of blacksmiths, the census labeled illiterate. And from illiteracy, they come with the name Fogey hammered into their blood. And from some other blood, we know they were purchased. I regard South Carolina as I do Ireland, two islands in the sea of my making. <clears throat> Sometimes I wonder what else the land has lied to me about. I wonder what the history books would say if they knew how blood could echo. I wonder today, as the news plays, what they expect me to think of social distancing, as if I'm not always six feet away 
from really knowing who I am. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. That was excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And especially from reading from your new manuscript, which I'm dying to know more about, if there's anything you can tell us. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, right now, do you want me to tell you right now? Yes, <laughs> um, so <clears throat> yeah, it's it's a work in progress that I was really um, you know, trying to get through last summer. Um, but then a lot of different reasons, I felt like I was kind of rushing it. So I've, I've taken a little bit of a step back, but um, the entire project, like I said, is tracing family history, um, not just in South Carolina, but also uh, north to Saskatchewan, Canada, west out to Las Vegas and Los Angeles, um, California, where I was born, um, and obviously very close in Pittsburgh. Um, and I'm trying to organize all of it around um, several different themes. Um, it's kind of the way that my brain works. So like the, the first book here, The Drowning Boy's Guide to Water, water is the main metaphor in this in this book. Um, and so everything about water is like a big metaphor for something else. And so I'm trying to do that with this other one about history, but also work in things about both blood um, and the heart um, without hopefully becoming like falling into the very easy cliche of like heart poetry that has a long history. I'm trying to maybe do something different with it. Um, no, but yeah, that's, that's, point out. yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. I'm so excited to hear about that. And I'll definitely look into adding um, the Drowning Boy's Guide to Water to our library collection. Um, if anybody's interested in checking that out, I'd really, really like that. Um, you talked about Pittsburgh in some of your poems, which is how we met. We met at school in Pittsburgh. And it really always struck me as a place with a really deep memory and a really deep loyalty. So it's interesting to hear sort of your perspective on that. And I think maybe how you take that in the other places you travel, have you found that sort of stays with you as you do your research? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of other poets who do really great work with place. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of like stepping into this idea in a new way. Um, but um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of general generational memory about place too in my family. Um, so that's one of the interesting things for me in this new project is um, kind of the well-worn paths of Pittsburgh that my family has um, several generations now <clears throat> myself not being born in Pittsburgh, but then coming back to it um, and uh, learning about how Pittsburgh, um, or sorry, not Pittsburgh, how Boston is a big part of my family's history. Uh, Chicago, um, North Dakota, which I've never been to, um, is like integral to my dad's side of the family um, existing. Um, so yeah, I think that to me, there's a line in, in one of the poems I read about the land lying to you. Um, and so that's something I'm exploring is like, you know, what are the things that literal land um, holds that's true? Um, and what are the things that we need to kind of like be on the lookout for? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'd also like to hear a little bit more um, about sort of your ideal writing process and what that writing process looks like now, how that I'm assuming has changed um, in the past year. Or so um, I know you balance another job as a teacher as well. So I'm curious to see how that all kind of fits into your mind and your brain and your time and what that experience has been like for you. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that I teach language arts <clears throat> at a school that allows me to do a big poetry unit with my seventh grade class in the fall. So I get to squeeze in some of my own writing with them, share some of my writing with them, uh, and honestly learn from seventh grade students um, who, you know, they don't always have the confidence that, um, you know, they think they need, but they, they have the creativity and I get inspired from that. Um, and one of the things I teach them and one of the things I put into practice as both teacher and writer is, um, remembering that writing is like 10% of the process and like thinking is 90%. And so I squeeze in a lot of time thinking about bits of conversation I've heard, um, imaginary scenes or real scenes I see uh, like on my commute um, or just like synthesizing different things from whatever books I'm reading. I've really turned into a big nonfiction reader since uh, college, which I not it was never that before. Um, but when I actually sit down to write, what I usually do, I keep a very long list of random things in a, the notes app on my uh, iPhone. And I just pluck out a few. There are some things that I 
uh, you know, kind of know that I want to get around to, and I'll usually set some time aside on the weekend. I can't go to coffee shops right now the way I, I normally like to, and I live right next to one too, but um, I do have a, a, a deck uh, and the weather's getting better. So I'll go out there and I like to write on the computer right now. Um, I used to be a big handwriting person. I think maybe one day I'll come back around to that, but I, I like being able to just pick like four different things for my notes app. And almost like a painter, like just drop them on like a, a palette and begin mixing things together um, and kind of seeing what I can come up with. I like to connect the dots between different ideas and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You also spoke a lot about chess and board games in your work, and I can sort of see that reflected in the process you're describing, sort of drawing lines between things and thinking ahead. That's really interesting. Yeah. Let's see. Robin, do you think we do you have any questions from chat on Facebook or in Zoom? Just to double check with everybody. Uh, I don't see any questions yet, but you okay. guys feel free to keep chatting. This is great. Sure. Uh, you mentioned you were a big nonfiction reader these days. What have you read recently that really you've been enjoying or have enjoyed recently? Oh, you know, I love really light reading like uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book Cast that came out, uh, I think, at the end of last year. Um, I think that was the, the last real big book I've been able to squeeze in. I don't get to read really as much as I'd like to right now as a teacher. I'm also in a, uh, a graduate program at the same time. So, you know, busy is my middle name, but um, yeah, books like cast, anything that has to do with sort of like both race theory and the history of race and like social movements and government have been uh, really informative to me. Um, it's sort of like the undercurrent of this new project is like, as a black man, like my family history is just completely intertwined um, and literally intertwined with my grandfather with the civil rights movement. He was a big um, figure in the Pittsburgh scene of the civil rights movement. Um, so that's a lot of what I've been reading in that regard. Um, trying to think of what else I've read recently. Um, I do get into a little bit of YA here and there, normally just for like, um, whenever I need to update my curriculum and bring a new book in. So I was recently reading The Hate You Give, um, fantastic, very long, but very well-written novel. Um, and also the movie I, I decided to watch and it, I think does a, an okay job, a pr pretty good job of sticking to the book, but the book was really good. Um, what else have I been reading? I usually am good at this. I also have, you know, as most writers and readers have a very long uh, need to read list that I have not honored yet. But. I'll never get through it, never. That's exactly. not the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's gratifying as a teen lover and I love to hear that you're reading YA. There's been really kind of a renaissance in young adult books recently. I've sort of felt they were kind of formulaic um, for a while. And now I feel like they're just really going for it. I think they're giving teen readers and young adult readers a lot of credit that they are able mm -hmm. to process these things and like handle it. They don't need to be coddled. So I'm really loving seeing that trend um, in young adult books and I recommend them for adults as well. Um, and Angie Thomas who wrote The Hate You Give has, um, I don't know if it's new, new anymore but she has a fairly new one out called Concrete Rose, um, mm -hmm. which may be worth looking into. That's good to hear. I always do. I like when people think <laughs> Yeah, like <laughs> I, I mean, and there's there's other ones that I need to get around to, like Chains by um, I'm forgetting who uh, oh, the, the name I of. I just the... was listening to that actually. Um, yeah. it was incredible. It was really, yes. really. I kind of tend. I read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy, so I could, and this is historical fiction. And I sort of like made myself. I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to branch outside my genre. And it was incredible, and the narration was beautiful. Um, so I'm really glad I did. I highly recommend that as well. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So actually put that at the top of your TBR. Like I, know I will. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a book that I've intended to teach for a while as both. I, I mentioned that I teach language arts. I also teach history at my school. Um, and I don't always quite get around to revolutionary history because I do like ancient world history and try to get as far as I can. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a book that I definitely would recommend. Um, and then not a, a YA book, but um, and I'm going to blank on the title of it. Salvage the Bones uh, by Jasmine Ward was another book that I recently read, um, which was like incredible. It was like it was like one of the best books I've ever read that almost is like a movie when you watch it because she is so poetic in her prose. Um, it's just like 
image after image just like waves over you and you're like, you can't stop reading it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd recommend Salvage the Bones by Jasmine Ward as well. I'm going to put that on my to be read list <laughs> and actually read it as well. <laughs> All right, Ellie, we have, um, we have a question um, from the chat from Anthony, um, excuse me, Anthony, if I'm saying your name, Berardi. Is, um, and it is, I was wondering what you think about the way something like Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds is categorized as young adult. I thought it was weird given that there's nothing about the writing or the subject matter that isn't suited for adults too. I, I don't know, just a weird thought I had the other night. Good to see you again and love your work as always. <laughs> um, I have to say, I am not familiar with that book. But I think the, the heart of the question that Anthony was asking was sort of um, YA that reads as something that's completely appropriate for adults at the same time, which I think um, as someone who works with and advocates a lot for <clears throat> emerging teens, preteens, um, you know, adolescent students, I think that's so important to, you know, I always kind of quip that like, you know, kids are full people, you know, not, I don't think anyone doesn't believe that, but it's sometimes hard to remember that like, they have just as sophisticated, they have the same burdens and histories and things going on in their lives. And I think, you know, honoring what they're able to, to comprehend and process is a really important thing when you're writing for an audience like that. Uh, but I also think not holding back on certain truths and certain subjects um, so that they learn about and learn from them is important. Um, one of my favorite books that I teach um, is the book Milkweed by Jerry Spinelli. And it's about um, the Holocaust and the Warsaw Ghetto. And every year I have kids who come in and they're like, yeah, I think I, I've heard about the Holocaust. I understand a little bit. And the book doesn't show all the horrors of the Holocaust, but it gives them a really good idea of what it was. And, you know, it's always a favorite book that the kids read as much as a favorite book that a teacher assigns you could be. Um, but they, you know, to me, that's one of those things where I like to keep it in my curriculum because um, it teaches them something real. It teaches them in a way that honors uh, childhood. Uh, the protagonist is someone who kind of like thinks uh, and acts kind of like in a childish way, but takes on really big aspects of history. So, um, yeah, I, it was sort of a roundabout answer. I, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the book that you mentioned, Anthony, but I do agree with the sentiment that, um, you know, writing writing real things for people, for, for young people is really important. Yeah, yeah, I have also not read Long Way Down, but I'm sort of familiar with it. It's the whole story is told as a young boy is riding an elevator down and it's stopping at several floors and he is sort of deciding whether or not to take revenge against someone who killed his brother. Um, but the whole book takes place in the elevator ride, which is really interesting. Um, I found that things get classified as YA mostly because of the age of the protagonist. So like whoever's in the book doing the stuff. If they're a YA, the book will probably be shelved YA. Um, and I find a lot of adult readers kind of like don't want to read kid books. Um, but that's sort of giving it a, you know, discredit. I think that there's a lot of really good information in there, really valuable information. Um, yeah, Jason Reynolds is, is quite prolific and I'd recommend anything he's read. <laughs> I mean, I, I, <laughs> this is maybe a little bit embarrassing, but I'm, I'm not really, I'm not embarrassed about it. My favorite um, book series of all time is Redwall by Brian Jakes. Um, yes, okay, thank you. And I, I grew up on that from like third grade until I forget when I stopped reading, probably like sixth grade or something. And I just couldn't stop reading. I don't even remember when my parents like handed me the first book, but once they did, it didn't stop. And you find the yeah. books. Yeah. I, and I, I still I have them I actually have a goal in like the next five years or something depending on my reading speed to like get through all the books again because I just love the magic of of you know both fantasy and also like uh, you know YA children's books mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah and I also find we have a lot of parents who have younger readers who age-wise would be considered like middle grade like kids books readers, um, but their reading level is advanced, so they want them to read YA books. Um, and mostly what determines that is, is not how it is written, but what it is about. So like you get some of those more mature themes. Um, so like maybe they can technically read it, but it's sort of up to the parent and the family to decide, you know, should they be reading it? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm really glad to hear that there's some, I mean, Redwall's a classic. You can't go wrong with Redwall. That's a classic, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And I would also say while we're on the subject, if, if we're not too close on time, um, but um, another thing I'm really passionate about is teaching poetry to kids that I think the general public wouldn't always assume is like right for kids. Um, with a little bit of work, with a little bit of digging, you can find poems that, you know, really surprise kids in positive ways because as they grow up, they kind of age out of nursery rhymes, rhyming couplets, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with those kinds of things, but to them, they're, you know, big signifiers of childhood. Um, and uh, poetry is something that if you don't keep up with it in your life, people begin to like put it away into this corner, like, okay, I did, I did poetry in school and now I'm an, an adult, you know, <laughs> exactly, they check that box. And so when I teach, when I teach my students, I introduce them to poets that I read, uh, like, Yusuf Komanyaka, um, uh, Vietnam War veteran, African-American poet um, from Louisiana. And, you know, I read them his poems about being um, in, in Vietnam and, and, you know, nearly losing his life. I don't read them anything that's, you know, overly graphic or anything like too harsh, but just like, yeah, like here's something that someone wrote about something they really felt deeply. What could you do? And, and you know, kind of let them have that opportunity to, to create and wonder as well. That's good to hear. Um, do you take advantage of National Poetry Month for these kinds of things with your students? Absolutely. COVID is really wrecking my plans for that, though. Um, but normally what I do is I, in my school, I, I print out this huge stack of like dozens and dozens of poems that I've like curated and I put them on different colored pieces of paper and I put them right by the end of the, um, the cafeteria line. So every day at lunch, I encourage kids to have lunch with a poem. Um, we do poem in your pocket day, um, which, you know, people print out a poem, find a poem, maybe sometimes memorize it. And then they're encouraged to share that poem with one another throughout, uh, whenever poem in your pocket day is, I forget which day it falls on. Um, and actually tomorrow at my school, we're doing something we call the burnt tongue, which is kind of like a beatnik, um, like poetry scene thing. So everyone's going to wear black. We're going to get tea lights. The kids are going to have like lemonade or hot chocolate. And some of them are going to share poems, songs, stories that they've written. So, um, yeah, at, at pretty much every turn, I'm always encouraging kids to, like, just listen to a poem or just listen to me talk about poetry <laughs> um, if, the, if they'll stand it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. That must be so exciting to have so many opportunities to sort of, you know, engage with them that way. That sounds like like one of the fun classes, you know. Not all classes are fun classes, but it sounds like you have a fun class. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try, you know. <laughs> All right, so I'll check with Robin one more time just to make sure we aren't missing any questions from any of the chat. Robin? Um, nope, just Anthony, you know, had replied that, you know, what, what you were saying was exactly what he was thinking too, that adults really should read um, these books. They don't have to be categorized, you know, just for young adult or middle readers that everybody should read some of these really amazing titles. Um, so that was the only other comment that we had. Great. Well, that is good to hear. I love to hear that. So I will turn it over to you, Cameron, if you have any closing words, anything you'd like to say. Um, thank you again so much for being here with us this evening. It's really meant a lot. Absolutely. I won't say much more than uh, I think everyone should always write something every day. Um, doesn't have to be too long, but um, whether it's poetry, whether it's a little scene of a YA or other kind of story, um, I don't know. I just want people to write, especially National Poetry Month. But otherwise, thank you so much to Robin and Ellen uh, for having me and doing this reading. It was real fun. All right. Thanks again, Cameron. Everybody enjoy your night. Take care. All right, Robin, now I'll check in with you again. Hmm.